Well, how many would say amen that God is good? Amen. Take your Bibles and turn to Psalm chapter 42. Psalm chapter 42. And we know that God's good. I mean, we're in God's house. You're here at the 9 o'clock service. You're tuned into live stream. I mean, we know that God is good. But what happens when our emotions, our feelings, our inner si- in- inwards lose sight of that? Is it, is it possible for a Christian to lose sight of God is so good? Is it possible for a Christian... Uh, to know that God is so good, to feel like He's not. To know that He's good, but to feel like He's not. They give all these derivations to the different generations, baby boomers, etc., uh, the millennials, Generation X, Generation Z. Generation Z would be what would be considered approximately ages 8 to 23. That would be Generation Z. What caught my attention with that generation, our young people, is that according to uh, a poll that was um, done with Generation Z, it revealed that 45% of the ones that were polled, that 45% of Generation Z, the 8 to 23-year-olds, that 45% of them dealt with some type of mental health disorders. Uh, depression, anxiety, those type of things. And uh, what's amazing, we look and say, well, of course, maybe the younger generation, uh, they're dealing with that. What about the older generations? The amazing thing is, is that the pattern for what we're going to talk about this morning, it has a way of just crossing every uh, gender boundary, uh, ethnic boundary, uh, age boundary. It has a way of just jumping every boundary and lighting on every one of us. It may be that uh, if you're older with a pre-existing condition and what 2020 has do- done is it has heightened the awareness of concerned health issues. Um, we have families that have lost loved ones or possibly loved ones could be at the point of passing away. Uh, I forgot who the the gentleman was that plays professional basketball. And he he is a player. I I don't know a lot about NBA, but he is a player. uh, I don't know about what caught my attention about the story. If I read this correctly, and I believe I did, was this NBA uh, basketball player has had seven, seven family members that have passed away from COVID-related deaths. And maybe you have had a season of people that you know, whether family or friends, that have passed away, and those things weigh on you. Uh, Parents are so concerned about their children right now. And how do we handle the scholastic aspect of their life, the schooling aspect of their life? And so we, we have to work our jobs. We have to provide for a family. We have job security we're worried about. And now we've got the kids doing virtual learning. How in the world do we juggle all of this? Uh, one of the big things that is has slowly uh, ate away at America, and I use that because that's where we live, is this isolationism. Isolationism. People are so tired of being isolated from their families, from seeing their grandbabies grow up or their children, uh, uh, whatever it may be, with a divorce-type situation. They don't get a chance to see them. Some people really battle the dark places of the mind. Uh, They can be okay one minute, and it's like something just comes in, and and now they're partly cloudy. Now they're just, they got a blah within their soul that they just can't, uh, they just can't figure it out. They can't put a finger on it. Uh, Many are dealing with, when in the world is this blooming thing ever going to end? When will we ever see normal? And the thing that may discourage them is with by your or my definition of normal is we may never, ever see that again. We are in the transition of a new normal within our society, our lives, and our families. Um, some people battle with the chemical imbalance that we have so much trouble explaining. Uh, some people deal with genetics that there's more of a propensity towards a melancholy, saddened state than other people would have. If you are are the individual that your makeup is that it's always positive, gung-ho, get over it, you will not understand somebody that is on the other side of that spectrum. Some have these, uh, they're just triggers, and what 2020 has done 
if we don't realize it or not, is 2020 has been one trigger after another trigger. Uh, what we, we've gone through uh, panic. We've gone through frustration. Uh, we have people now that one of the emotions that is exhibiting itself because of such frustration with all of these things is there is more of a, of a, a situation with anger now than uh, I think you and I have seen for a long time. Divisiveness is run absolutely absolutely rampant and so we deal with COVID or we deal with riot or we deal with death or we deal with the election or we deal with fraud or we deal with family or we deal with would you like to go ahead and fill in something else and it's just one thing after another thing after another thing and what is slowly happening if uh, as I'm watching individuals and talking with people is it's like going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into a hole and light is being turned off incrementally where at one point in people's lives they walked in light now they're walking in darkness they said of depression it's when a person feels discouraged, sad, hopeless, unmotivated. Uh, they're disinterested in life in general. Uh, when these periods last and these feelings last for a short time, we sometimes give the, the derivation of somebody has the blues within their life. But what happens when it's not the blues? What happens when it lasts more than a week or two weeks? What happens when it becomes a daily companion within your life? What happens when it inhibits you from being able to love on your grandkids? Uh, when it inhibits you from loving on your children? Well, what happens when it inhibits you from being able to get out of bed? What is it that it, when it inhibits you? The, I was reading a secular study uh, on this, and it was amazing. Even from the, a, a secular study, they said one of the uh, triggers, one of the things that points toward people being depressed is all of a sudden there's a lack, in spirit, there's a lack of interest, uh, not only in all things, but especially in spiritual things. And so their daily personal life will begin to reflect that. Their church attendance will reflect that. And so what happens when it, when it lasts... And and it won't go away. How, how do we deal with these feelings? How do we deal with these situations within our life? Unless you would think, well, not many people go through this. Depression is so, so, so common um, that there's, there's several factors. Depression is so common that the, the doctors, they, they would label it as the common cold of mental health. See, there's mental illness and there's mental health. And there are those that are, are, are physically healthy, and there are those that have illnesses within their physical health. And our mind is the same way. We, we battle different things. And uh, one person said that in many of our lives, and especially in church, that there is such a stigma that is placed on this that we, we don't recognize it. We, we don't biblically handle it. We ostracize people. And we put a stigma on it, that if we were ever honest with what's really going on in our hearts and in our lives, then instead of getting help, all we do is we feel more shame. One of the men said this as he had dealt with pastors and dealt with other leaders that people look at and say, okay, you're the leader, you're supposed to be strong, you, you're not supposed to have any problems. It was amazing as I read through the article that this man said, these are the people that suffer silently. And as I thought about that phrase, I thought about so many Christians. We look at the 9 o'clock service, and you have been saved for so long. You have been so faithful. Oh, my soul, you have been so faithful. As your pastor, I'm incredibly proud of you. I love you so much. But uh, you're the silent sufferers. You're the ones that won't say anything. You're the ones that your children go to, your grandchildren go to, people go to. You work jobs that uh, very likely you were the one that people came to uh, as the boss or the one that gave instructions or directions. And, and all of a sudden, quote, unquote, you're the one that has it all put together. But what happens when the person that has it all put together for everybody to see outwardly has it unraveling on the inside? The silent sufferers. And we look at Christians, and they're the silent sufferers. Because if I was to tell you, or if you were to tell me, you, I have a problem with depression, I have a problem with feelings on the inside, I, I know that God loves me mentally, biblically, I know that God loves me, but inside, I have questions about that. And so many people are challenged with this, and they're afraid to be able to be honest with themselves, others, and with God. One man said depression is like the red warning light on the dashboard of your car. You can ignore it if you want to, but when the car breaks down, you can't, you can't, you can't blame the red warning light. 
I saw a funny cartoon one time of how uh, a dear person was driving a car and the warning light, Brother Jim, came on that th there was something wrong with the car. And so the next scene showed the individual taking a piece of tape and putting it over the red light in the car going, and then the little caption was something like, well, now that's better. And what we do in a Christian life is we take our tape and we put it over it. And we're like, if I don't, if I don't see it, if I don't think about it, then I don't have to deal with it. And I'll be honest with you, and I know there's several, several stances on this. I know that even this week I've talked to several different attitudes. I have, I have talked to a, a wide range of people trying to get some type of, of grasp on this to be able to help God's people. Because I, I firmly believe, especially with 2020 and all the traumas, if you wanted to call them that, maybe the, the shocks to the soul that people have endured, that people are really battling a lot of things. And on top of all of this, and that's the reason the, the series is called All I want for Christmas is sanity because everything is so insane. I mean, if you look at some of the things that have come across the news or that our society has dealt with, I mean, you're like, really? I mean, really? Are we really, really dealing with this? Am I the only one that some of this stuff I've had to pinch myself and go, okay, is, is this real or not? Okay, and so maybe you're battling some of those things, and what you'd like to have is just a little bit of sanity, a little bit of, uh, I like to get my hands on hold of something that just makes sense, and that's where we're going to turn in our Bible this morning, because some of the feelings that we don't verbalize, that we don't make public, it's amazing in the Word of God, God did, and in Psalm chapter 42, look at verse 1 with me, Psalm chapter 42, now I want you to look at me just for a second, I don't mean that bossy or mean, but would you look at me just for a second, as I read through this and you're reading along in your Bible or on the screen, as you're reading through this, try to put emotion in it, try to put feeling in it, try to put a human in what's being said, all right, as a, as a heart, that's a deer, as a heart panteth after the water brooks, now so, my, so, pa so panteth my soul, after thee, O God. We're just going to read through the whole thing. Verse 2. He said, My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? Verse 4. When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me. For I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with a voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept holy day. Verse 5. Why art thou cast down on my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan and of the Hermonites from the hill Mizar. Deep calleth on the deep of the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me, and my prayer unto the God of my life. I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a sword in my bones, mine enemies reproach me, while they say daily unto me, where is thy God? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. Could you feel the emotion of this man, David, that is writing this? David, the man after God's own heart. David, the general and commander. David, the king and ruler of Israel. David, David, David. Notice the expression of his soul. And if he was to sit down and we would be me at my uh, side of the desk and him on the other side of the desk. And he was to be talking and he was to say all this stuff. What, what conclusion do you think I would gather from that? What conclusion would you gather from that? If David is sitting there, what does his face look like? What does his countenance look like? What does his voice sound like? What's in his eyes? What's in his posture? If David was saying this to you as an individual and to me as an individual, what is the whole makeup of this man that is sharing what is going on in the innermost depths of his soul? See, the first thing is this, the seriousness, the serious problem of depression. David said, why art thou cast down on my soul? 
Why am I bowed down, laid low? Why in the world am I in the pits? Why do I have such a, a melancholy, down and out blue spirit? Why art thou disquieted within me, he says? Why is this internal turmoil going on? This word and the thought of this word, the islands in the Pacific, they take the word pity and it means the barking of the bowels, the, the l- lament of of the soul. And David's like, why art thou cast down on my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Modern day verbiage. Ready? What in the world is going on with me? Why in the world am I feeling like this? Have you ever looked in the mirror and don't say Tony, but maybe you said your own name. Have you ever looked in the mirror and went, Tony, what in the world is going on with you? Have you ever tried to explain the unexplainable in your own life? Somebody ever look at you and say, well, would you please explain that? And you'd be like, I can't. I can't explain it. Well, why do you feel that way? I don't know. I don't know. Well, let's get up out of it. I've tried. I've tried. And all of a sudden, has there there ever been a weight that was stronger than your willpower? Because in the Christian life, we, the willpower, the, the faith, we, you know, uh, we want to we just, we're going to faith it for God. Not fake it, we're going to faith it for God. I, we're going to do it by faith, right? And what happens when the weight and the burden of what's going on within you is stronger than your willpower? And instead of going up, you find yourself going further down. He says, why art thou disquieted within me? Within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. All through the Bible... Uh, and again, there's a, a, a biblical, balanced way of handling all of this. I really believe that with all my heart. As you go through the Bible, if you were to, to talk to different people, I want to read these verses. I've shared some of them with you before, but you ever thought about Moses? How many of y'all would say with an amen, Moses was a godly man? Amen or no? Okay. Watch with me in Numbers 11. Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? And wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight that thou layest the burden of all this people upon me? See, I'm talking to the 9 o'clock service, and I'll talk to the 11 o'clock service, and no matter what service, but 9 o'clock service, you, you by and large, are the ones that uh, have been laid the burden of the people on. Uh, the burden of your family, they lie on you. Uh, it doesn't matter how old your kids get. Uh, the burden of the family still lies on you. They still come to you. They still ask of you. Your kids can be 40 or 50, maybe 60 years old. And it's amazing that they are near retirement themselves. But when they have a problem, who do they still come to? They still come to you. And so all of a sudden, he's looking, at, he's looking and he says unto the Lord, Why hast thou afflicted thy servant? Have you ever looked at God and said to the God of heaven, God, what are you doing to me? God, Really? And more? Oh, good. Yay, more. Praise the Lord. More. Thank you, Jesus. Well, Moses got to the point in place that he said to the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? And wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight? Have you ever asked God in heaven, God, what have I done wrong? God, why are you mad at me? God, why are you upset at me? If you would just show me what I did wrong, I tell you, I'm sorry. It's not like I'm trying to live in open rebellion. God, what in the world? What, ready? What do you want from me, God? What do you want from me? He says, wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? Wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight? Surely God's mad at me. I mean, well, uh, why do you say God's mad at you? Well, if God wasn't mad at me, why do I have all this garbage on me? Well, why haven't I found favor in thy sight that thou layest the burden of all this people upon me? And uh, you go through the course of a day, and before today is over with, how many phone calls will you get? How many phone calls will you get? Uh, Pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. Daddy, I've got this and this and this. Mom, I've got this and this and this. Uh, We just lost our our job. We've got these bills. I don't have money for the grandkids. I don't have money for the kids. I don't have, uh, my job's going to be laying off. I've got this, I've got this, I've got this. How many phone calls and conversations today in in the course of a week? How many of those will you have placed on you and placed on you and placed on you and placed on you? And it's not a matter, I mean, it would just really surprise everybody in your life and your family that you have your own problems too. Paul's like, it's not enough that I've got what I've got going on. He's like, I've got the care of all the churches on me. All of a sudden, have you ever reached a point in place, you're like, wow, I can't take anymore. I think I'm at the end of myself. Welcome to Moses. Uh, He says, have I conceived all these people? Did I bring this on myself? Didn't watch this. Have you ever looked at God? And you don't mean it mean, and you're not trying to be pompous with God. Have you ever looked at God and said, I didn't ask for this. I didn't ask for this. I did not. I didn't volunteer for this. I did not sign up for this. I did not ask for this. Have I conceived all these people? 
Have I begotten them that thou should say us unto me, carry them in thy bosom as a nursing father beareth a sucking child, suckling child unto the land which thou swearest unto the fathers? Did I ask for millions of kids like this? Did I ask for all this responsibility? Did I ask for this? When should I have flesh, verse 13, to give in all the people? How in the world am I going to take care of all these folks? How in the world can I take care of all, watch this, how can I, how can I take care of all their needs? See, you're good people. And within you is a desire to meet the needs of people around you. But what happens when you have more needs than resources? You have more needs than financial resources. You have more needs than emotional resources. You have more needs than financial, uh, emotional, physical resources. What happens is when your stack of needs is this high and your resources are this high, how do you handle that? And Moses came to the point in place, he's like, okay, I feel like, I feel like my resources are here. The needs are up here. Dear God in heaven, what are you doing to me? Now they want flesh to eat. Look at verse 14. I'm not able to bear all this people alone. Why? Because it's too heavy for me. And now watch as all of this accumulates, and this is the man that loves God. As all of this accumulates, he says this in verse 15. Uh, 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 verse 14, I'm not able to bear all this people alone because it's too heavy for me. Verse 15, and if thou deal thus with me. Now, what's he saying? If this is my lot in life, if this is how, God, you're going to work in my life, if thou deal thus with me. Now, the next two words just don't fit, do they? The next two words we would not want to acknowledge, would we? We wouldn't, we wouldn't claim them. We would think them. And if this is the life that you're going to give me, and if this is what I've got to look forward to, and if this is what I'm going to experience, just go ahead and take my life. Kill me. Why? He says, and if thou, and if thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee, out of hand, if I found favor in thy sight, and let not me see my wretchedness. He says, Lord, if you want to be a blessing to me, if you want to do me a favor right now, could I just, can I just go home? And I would think, if there was honesty, more than one Christian has identified with Moses. They understood the lament of Elijah, the great preacher that had prayed down fire from heaven, outrun the chariot home of the king, was powerfully used of God. He was expended spiritually. He was expended emotionally. He was expended physically. And when he had no more left within him, that was when the words of Jezebel came to his ear and dug within his heart and sent him running and lamenting before God, isolating himself, saying, God, take my life. Elijah, Jonah, Jonah's like, it's better for me to die than to live. And person after person, goes through these situations in the Word of God. The serious problem of depression. We don't talk about it. We don't deal with it. We don't acknowledge it. We don't recognize it. Because, gosh, if we were really honest with somebody, then what would they think? And there's so many people that are the silent sufferers because they are so concerned about what people think. They live with panic attacks. They live with such levels of anxiety that it distracts. They're uncomfortable in their soul. They lash out at other people. People say hey, they're, 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 they're just unloving or they're not sociable. No, they're suffering on the inside. And so the serious problem, the symptoms is we look at David's life and uh, all that David has gone through. A lot of the depression and manic states that people experience, they've never been able to put a finger on what brought forth these things. And a lot of it has to do with traumas, uh, things that were just so discombobulating to the soul that it just had a deeper impact on them than what they recognize themselves. Uh, one thing in counseling and talk, I'm not really a counselor, I just talk to folks and listen a lot. Um, but one of the things that just always has caught my attention is someone sharing something from their past or something from their life. And as I'm watching them, what's going through my mind is this. What they're telling me right now, they do not see how 
It has so impacted their life. What they can't see right now is the very thing that they're sharing with preacher is the very thing that has birthed the problems that they're experiencing in their life right now. David, David lost his son named Absalom. And if you've ever dealt with someone that has lost a child, some of the most heartbreaking words that I have ever heard from good, godly people is, Preacher, I was not supposed to bury my child. David buried his child. Loss of wealth, financial security. Do you know what it's like to talk to people that have worked so diligently all their life? They have really been hard workers. Only to watch in the latter part of their life, everything that they work for vanish away. Loss of power, a loss of control. Can't control my family, I can't control my situations, and now I've reached an age where I can't even control my body. A loss of control. David had a daughter that had been raped. Can you imagine the trauma of that? David's life consisted of turmoil, heartache, and heartbreak. One thing after another thing after another thing. And the load got heavier and the load got heavier and the load got heavier. And you're like, well, what David's going through, preacher, really wasn't that big deal. Have you ever heard the expression, the straw that broke the camel's back? The straw isn't heavy. Did you notice that? The straw that broke the camel's back, the straw in and of itself was not really a big deal. The straw was not that heavy at all. The straw was not really that large of a, of a thing. The straw that broke the camel's back is the expression of one more thing added to everything else I've been experiencing and going through. It is enough. It, 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 was, it was the one thing that pushed me over the line in my life. David has experienced that. David's experienced spiritual dryness. As you look at verse 1, he says, As a heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. He says in verse 2, My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. I want to come and appear before God. And so as believers, what starts happening as we look at depression and, and look at the being discouraged, the downtrodden, and start going down a tunnel that we feel like we can't get back out of, is now our spiritual life. Of all the things that's going to fail us, our devotions are going to fail us, our prayer time is going to fail us, the church service is going to fail us, and all of a sudden, well, preacher can't keep my attention, or the services aren't exciting, or Brother Jason needs other songs, or, and there's always some type of excuse because all of a sudden, spiritually, the one thing that we could count on, the one place that was a rock within our soul, the one thing that has always been there for us, we finally, we reach a point in place of that straw and the camel's back. Even our spiritual life starts falling apart. David experienced spiritual dryness. Why is God so far off? Why has God forsaken me? Why has God left me? As you look through your life, and I look through mine, the devotions are dry. The prayer time is dry. David went through spiritual dryness. And then notice this in verse 3. He cried continually. Emotions overtook him. He said, my tears have been my meat day and night. What do you want for breakfast? Tears. What do you want for supper? Tears. What do you want during the day for a snack? Tears. My tears have been my meat day and night. While they continually said in me, it's like my tears themselves are an enemy against me. Because even my tears are saying, where is thy God? Wait a minute, I understand my enemies doing that. I understand people against me doing that. But now my own tears, as they trickle down my face, it's like they're proponents against me going, way to go, preacher. Way to go, life group leader. Way to go, grandma. Way to go, Paul. Paul. Way to go, spiritual man. Way to go, spiritual woman. You're so spiritual, all you can do is sit here and cry. You can't do anything about it. Where is your God now? Even my tears are screaming at me. Because as a Christian, surely if I was more spiritual, I wouldn't be responding like this. If I was more spiritual, I wouldn't be feeling this. If I was more spiritual, I wouldn't be experiencing this. So guess what I get to add to my depression? Guess what I get to add to my discouragement? Guess what I get to add to all this darkness in my soul? Now I get to add guilt. Hey, yay me! Where's that God? He, spiritual dryness, you know, crying continually, emotional upheaval... Uh, look at verse 3, the latter part, shame and defeat. Where is thy God? Well, if you were such a winner, God would be more for you. If you were more of a winner, God would be there for you. I mean, if you're more spiritual, if you're more godly, if you're more like, in the name, if you're more like Brother Jim Sizemore, if you're more like Perry Kirk, if you're more like Maggie Bradford, if you're more like Phil, if you're more like them, 
shame, defeat. You want to help somebody and you can't even help yourself? David had spiritual dryness and crying continually and emotional upheaval, shame and defeat. These lingering memories, verse 4, just kept haunting him. When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me. I, I am poured out. This is an in, inward deal here. I pour out my soul in me for I, 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 I went with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God. Uh, I went with them with the voice of joy and praise with the multitude that kept holy day. I, I went with them. I remember how things were. I remember what things used to be. I remember all these things. I remember what the good old days were like. I remember what it used to be like in church. I remember what it used to be like in my family. I remember what it used to be like in the revival meetings. I, I remember what it's like in the singings. I remember when the gators got up. I remember the joy that filled my heart. I remember the strength that I had. I remember the power that I had. I remember the purpose that coursed through me. I, I remember these things. And instead of these memories taking and strengthening me, it's like another hammer on the nail driving it deeper in my life. Because I remember what it used to be like. And now I live with what used to be, never will be. And it's never going to change. And it's never going to get better. And we're never going to have it like we used to. And we, are you following me? And so now memories, memories linger and permeate our heart and our mind. He looks and he says to them, in verse 6, he says, oh my, oh, oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. I'm so downtrodden within me, that cast down, if you've been following the, the psalm series, then that cast down was a sheep that got on its back, flailing its legs, unable to right itself. And if the shepherd didn't come along and right that sheep back up on his legs and get the circulation going again, that sheep died. Now, am I allowed to be honest in here? Yes, three? Okay, I want to be honest with three of y'all. You know when we, what happens when we see Christians that are cast down for whatever reason when they're going through this kind of stuff? If we're not careful, we kick them. Or we comment about them. Well, you know, if they love God more. You know, if they, they, if they had just a little more Jesus. And if we're not very careful, wow, I don't know where empathy and compassion went. When the sheep is cast down, the shepherd doesn't go up to that sheep and kick it. Go, stupid sheep, and walk off. Sometimes Christians, we, we kick other Christians, call them weak, stupid Christians, ungodly Christians. And we kick them and we walk off. Well, what the shepherd does is the shepherd will stand the sheep up, put the shepherd, the sheep between his knees, holding, holding the sheep up, rubbing the legs until circulation comes. The shepherd will make sure that sheep is able to walk again before it leaves the sheep. There are people that's in your life. You say, preacher, will this take a lot of energy from me? It will take a lot of energy from you because you've got to hold them up. And that's what, that, that's what has worn some of y'all out over the years is you've been the one to hold everybody else up, and now you need the Holy Spirit to hold you up. See, the seriousness of this, it has a way of permeating every single life. And the funny thing is, is people that would look at me and say, well, you know, they need to handle it better this, or they need to do this, or they shouldn't have a problem as believers this, or, you know, the ones, that, the funny thing, very likely, would be the ones saying that would be ones I would spend a, a good amount of time holding them up and getting their circulation going and encouraging them, but they can see the fault in other people, but they can't see the problem in their own life. Is your circulation gone this morning? I told you before, and I tell you again, my concern for Christianity is numbness. People, people are, are beyond feeling. And David, he's feeling, right? He's just feeling the darkness in his soul. He, through the Word of God, is publicly sharing with us. But how long have you been silently suffering? You can't even tell your spouse. You can't tell your kids. Your grandkids think that you wear a blooming cape, so there's no way we're going to tell the grandkids. And so the provision for this, we've seen the symptoms and the seriousness. Notice what David did as I close. You've listened so good. He says, verse 5, why art thou cast down on my soul? He, he's recognizing what's going on. He knows what's going on. Why art thou cast down on my soul and why art thou disquieted within, now watch this, within me? 
See, the first step is we're going to look within, and we're going to analyze our heart. You've got to look within and analyze your heart. What, what's going on in your heart? He says, verse 6, Oh my God, my soul is cast down within me, therefore will I remember thee. From Jordan to, 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 to Mizar, he says, I'm going to remember the goodness of our God. I, I want to look within and realize, why do I feel the way that I feel? What's going on in your life? What is unresolved in your life? Do you have bitterness? Do you have unforgiveness? Do you have things that have happened years and years ago that have never been resolved through the blood of Jesus Christ? Relationally, relationally, are there things that are uh, awry relationally within your life that uh, without even realizing it, the, the lack of closeness in that relationship has brought a separation within your soul, your relationship with others, your relationship with God? What's going on on the inside? What's going on in your mind? What thoughts are going on in your mind? People look and they say a various, over the years, they said it various different ways. But you know what it's like as a, as, as a man, forget being the pastor, as being a man and being a friend, uh, being an individual. Do you know what it's like to have somebody sit across from you and say something along the lines of, I just don't think my life is worth living? The number of people that take their own life don't feel like their life was worth it. Don't, ready for this? I've heard verbatim with my ears these words. If I were to die or vanish away, no one would miss me anyway. And so all of a sudden thoughts in my mind, emotions within my heart, feelings within my soul. I want to give you what you need to see. But all of a sudden, would you be one of the ones that everybody comes to? You've been there to help everybody. Everybody needs you for strength. Everybody needs you to hold them up. And all of a sudden, you are the one that will be labeled the silent sufferer. But because you're so strong because of who you are, then we would never let anybody know that because, gosh, we got enough problems on our hands. We don't need the attitudes and opinions of others to add to that. Look within, analyze your heart. What's the heart issue with this? Pride? Pity? Now, some people are just a constant counseling session. doesn't matter what's going on. It's going to be tainted with negative. Uh, it's a beautiful day outside. Yeah, but it's supposed to rain tomorrow. What, I mean, what are you supposed to do with that, right? And so I look within and analyze my heart. I look up. Number two, I look up and, and I recognize my help. He says in verse 8, Yet the Lord will command His loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night His song shall be with me. And my prayer unto the God of my life. I will say unto God my rock. He's going to question God. Why hast thou forgotten me? He's talking with God. Why go out mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? He's having a conversation with God. He's praying to God. And he's, he's writing himself before God. See, maybe just a thought with this. The, having the problem is not going to escape any of us. Every, I, I am of this, of this persuasion. Everybody sitting in this room, listening by way of live stream, is going to come in at 11. No matter where in the world that I go, I think that every single person, to some extent, deals with what we're talking about this morning. And either I can, now watch this, I need to understand the problem. I need to recognize the problem. I need to be empathetic with the problem. I need to be compassionate with the problem. But either I can have the problem be so large... Or I can allow the problem solver to be larger than my problem. The problem is a definite in my life. The question is whether or not I'm going to allow the problem solver to handle this problem that's eating my lunch. So I'm going to look up. I'm going to look up and recognize that's where the help is. Truth. Truth is going to help me to get away from error. The Lord loves you. The Lord is concerned about you. The Lord is compassionate about you. The Lord has not left you, and the Lord has not forsaken you. There's a God in heaven that's with you right now, and God wants to be with you so much. The relational aspect of it is He gave you the Holy Spirit, which is known as the Comforter, to continually abide and reside within your heart and within my life. The Holy Spirit right now in you as a believer, the Holy Spirit of God is with you. The Holy Spirit of God loves you. The Holy Spirit of God is there to help you and to strengthen you. The Holy Spirit. Jesus says, I'm going to go but before I go. I'm going to make sure you're not left alone. And so all of a sudden when depression hits, loneliness and isolation, they flood our hearts. And so I've got to recognize the Holy Spirit's work. I've got to look within and, and I'm going to analyze my heart. Why am I feeling like this? Why am I experiencing these things? I'm going to look up and recognize my help. My help cometh from the Lord. And then as, as I close, I'm going to look onward and realize there's hope. 
Hey, this isn't the end. It doesn't matter what happens today. This isn't the end. This isn't the end. Somebody looked and, and, and through talking and conversationally over the last couple of weeks, they're like, preachers, this is where it's going to always be. I was like, no, it's going to get worse. I'm just seeing if y'all are listening this morning. I don't know what is going to happen. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not, I, that's not my job to know what's going to happen. But I do know this. I, I know that no matter the situation, there's always hope. There's always hope in our Lord. He says, why art thou cast down? Why art thou? Now, David's pr- going to start preaching to himself. Why are you cast down? Why are you disquieted with him? He says, hope thou in God. Now, you turn. He's saying to himself, David, turn to God. Hope in God. Praise God. I- I'll, tell you, I- I'll tell you what will help you and I. Prayer and praise. There was a preacher years and years ago. Is not Martin Luther King, but Martin Luther. Years ago, years ago, Martin, his name Martin Luther. And uh, it was amazing reading about him, that he's like, I've got so much to do and so much required of me. Now, now listen closely. I've got so much to do and so much required of me, I must spend the first three hours of every day in prayer. You know, in your life and my life, before we can help other people, we've got to help ourselves. Before you can help straighten out, and I don't mean that in a derogatory sense, before you help to straighten out other people, you've got to straighten out yourself. And that's the reason devotional in these prayer, uh, these uh, Bible reading plans and those type of things, as we help to get our soul set on the problem solver, it helps us with the problem. When my focus and my attention are on God, I'm like, why in the world, Tony, are you feeling like this? Why are you going through this? What is happening in your heart? Tony, be honest with your heart. Be honest with your life. Why are you doing this? Why did what they say affect you so much? Why did what happened bother you so much? Why are you dealing with this in such a negative way? What's going on with your emotions and your mind and your thoughts and your heart? Tony, are you, are, are you personally, not as a preacher, as a, as a child of God, are you turned towards God? Are you leaning on God? Are you loving on God? Are you praising God? Prayer and praise go a long way. Because, you know, there's hope. Our hope is in God. I am so glad, grateful, that you and I as believers, that there is sanity during this season. And that sanity is in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are in a crazy day and age. But you know what? Isn't every day and age crazy? Isn't every generation messed up? We look and we're like, boy, this generation. Well, can I humbly say this? There are several generations represented in this room, and every one of us are screwed up. Are y'all with me? We, 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 we're different, but we messed up. You're, listen, well, when I was a kid, bless God. When you were a kid, you sinned different. You knew how to hide it different. You knew how to scam your parents different. Yours was a little bit different. But where the kids are doing, it, doing uh, the, the, their quote-unquote cigarette smoking in the back of a car at AutoZone, you and your buddy went to the back of the barn and smoked it. But it's the same blooming cigarette. Are y'all with me? We so funny. Boy, this generation today, they screwed up just like your generation was. It's just a different, different look. And that's the reason Jesus Christ came to die for the whole world. Every generation. And one of the things we all deal with is we deal with depression. I think that it's more, more prevalent today in the sense of this. There's more known about it. There are things that maybe there's a generation in here that like, well, we, we, didn't, we didn't have this talked about. Well, because it wasn't that much known about. There, it wasn't a matter that people didn't have the same diseases or the same things of a generation gone by. It's just that it wasn't recognized and talked about as much. And we're in a generation, we're in a day and time that more and more is getting to be known about what's going on in the hearts, lives, souls of the people. And if you don't think depression has been around for a while, go take a look at Adam and Eve's family. Take a look at David's family. Take a look at my family. Take a look at your family. And we all deal with that. And I'm so grateful that we have the power of the Holy Spirit within our hearts and within our lives to help us Go through anything. God gives peace. God gives calmness. God gives hope. See, some came in this morning after a week of anxiety, of just things are up in the air, news that you've received, or even maybe worse, the news that you may receive. It's been a crazy week. Can somebody say amen? My wife told me yesterday, gosh, we're we're, we're just in a day and age. My wife told me yesterday of a young man that we knew when he was a kid. He's probably 24-ish, 25-ish. 
And I just found out yesterday, but Thursday, or Friday, somebody went into his home and shot him dead. Crazy day and age. He was 24, 25 years of age. How would you like that phone call? You say, well, my trauma is not nearly of that size. No. Follow in context as I pray. But somebody came into your life and they shot something. There was something that was taken away from you. It may not be a son. But it was something that was taken away from you. It was sudden. It was traumatic. And it laid its marks upon your life. You don't talk about it to other people. You don't share it with other people. There's a possibility that you don't even acknowledge it yourself. But something happened within one of your friends. Something happened with one of your family. It was your son, daughter. It was your grandson, your granddaughter. But something came in and it was taken from you. And those marks have laid hold upon your life. And you look and you wonder and you think and you ask, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. I can focus on the problem and I need to realize it. Or I can focus on the problem solver and allow him to do in me what I cannot do myself. Tony has got to stop depending upon Tony. And Tony has got to start depending upon God. Father, we love you. Help us to turn to you, love you, confide in you, rest in you. We read all these beautiful things in the Word of God, and we pray they be a reality within our life. One of my heroes in the Bible, David, is going through just an incredibly tough time through the Scripture. And emotionally and mentally and spiritually, it has affected his whole life. And thank you for the encouragement David and your word gives me to turn my focus and attention upon you. The song says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. And I could stop right there and don't need to quote any more of the song. Because I need to look to the author and the finisher of my faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I need to rest on him. Now, Lord, there's people that are battling this morning. It may be here in person or way, by way of live stream. But the truth is... If we could see their soul, it's cast down. And it's kicking and flailing and trying and, and they feel like it's failing. And what they need is that good shepherd to come alongside now and to righten them up and get the circulation going so they can walk once again. For those that are battling, Lord, looking for just a little bit of sanity during this season, I pray they would find it in the bedrock relationship of our God in heaven and His Son, Jesus Christ. As your heads are bowed and eyes are closed. See, that's, that's the main thing, is our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Do you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior? Maybe you're listening by way of live stream and in your living room or maybe even lying in your bed. You're like, you know what? Uh, I know about Jesus, but I've never placed my faith and trust in Him as my personal Savior. And if you've never done that, that's going to be a personal decision. And today would be a great day. It would, it's not the words of a preacher that would save you. It's the attitude of a heart that confesses its sin before God and placing faith and trust totally and entirely in what Jesus Christ has done for us, his death and his burial and resurrection. And maybe you would pray something along this line. It's not a form prayer, but something along the lines of, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I've sinned. I know that I have. And Lord Jesus, I take right now and I place my life in your hands. I place my faith and my trust in your death, burial, and resurrection. I want you to be my personal Savior. Come into my heart and my life. Take control. Save me, Lord. And I would hope and pray that if you, you've never prayed, receive Christ as your Savior. That today would be a day you make that decision. And maybe if you would make that decision, you'd like to talk to somebody. On live stream, there's a connect card there that we would love to get in touch with you and help you take your next steps in the faith. If you're here this morning, we would love to have somebody to speak with you personally about your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. The second thing is this. You are saved. And you're ashamed of how you feel. Ashamed of how you've been battling things. 
questioning yourself, not only God. And today I would just humbly, humbly, humbly like to say to you, you're not alone. Let the God of heaven, through his Holy Spirit, give you strength. We do not have to live in depression. We do not have to. We will battle with it, some more strongly than others. But we don't have to live in it. For faith is the victory that overcomes the world. And the joy of the Lord is my strength. May God's Holy Spirit give you strength and help and grace today. Father, bless God's people as we leave today. If we ask all this in Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, y'all good? Everybody good? Everybody ready to leave?